Um, this afternoon, I'm really pleased to welcome Anna Herity, who is, as you know, the co-founder and CEO of CPL Resources PLC. Anna's been a first of many things. She's the first woman to run a PLC, and she's been involved in, uh, in businesses, but has been recognised as uh, the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year in 2006, but also chaired that programme last year and I think in 2016. That's right. Yeah, um, she's uh, presently director of IBEC, but is also a past um, president. Our CPL Resources is the leading, I think, employment service company in the country and has over 12,000 people working on behalf of CPL on client uh, projects. And they've 32 offices, is that That's right? right? Nine countries. Yeah. So it's a very, very big um, enterprise. And as you can see, it's Ireland's, but also moving into Europe, leading uh, provider of permanent, temporary and contract jobs. So Anne is in a very good position to see what is happening in the world of work. And I'm delighted, Anne, that you'll be talking to us about the artificial intelligence, the precariat and the future of work. And we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joyce. Um, good afternoon. I'm delighted to be with you this afternoon. And Joyce, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so, you know, I suppose we're all familiar with the headlines that we're seeing uh, regularly now, um, which is really focusing on the whole rise of the robots and the rise of artificial intelligence. And I suppose we worry about uh, will the machines ultimately take our jobs? And I think we worry also about the time when um, artificial intelligence will surpass human cognition. And what will that mean for us? Is it going to mean the death of work? Um, or, you know, how are we going to cope uh, when that happens? Um, now, I don't think it will mean the death of work because there's also an alternative view out there. And the alternative view is fantastic. The ro robots are coming. Bring it on. They're going to take away the drudgery out of my job. It's going to be automated. And I'm going to be free to do much more interesting and creative work. Now, whichever view you take, I think there's no doubt that artificial intelligence and robotics is going to massively impact the future of work and, indeed, uh, the workforce. And for the most part, it feels to me like we're very unprepared for this. Uh, I think in ter even the term future work is a little bit misleading because it suggests that that change is way out there somewhere in the future. But actually, what we're seeing is the change the changes are happening here and now, right in front of us. And uh, I think the truth is that many of the changes that are driven by artificial intelligence um, are going to have huge implications both for the individual, for our organisations, but also for public policy as well. And I think that what's getting lost in all the noise and the media headlines is the reality that the future of work um, encompasses a very broad range of challenges. Now today I'm just going to look at three of those challenges that I see. Um, and the first is the impact of technology and the use of uh, robotics and artificial intelligence on the workplace. I mean, we know that technology is transforming the nature of work, and it's forcing us uh, businesses to think about jobs in a, a totally different way. Um, I think the second thing I'd like to talk about is the need for the education system to modernize, to meet the challenges that are presented by a workplace that's driven by technology. In the new world of work, I think your success is really going to depend largely on your appetite to continue learning and to constantly reskill. And then thirdly, I'd like to focus on how the relationship between the employer and the employee is changing. I mean, we're seeing the growth of alternative or atypical um, employment arrangements. And a lot of these are brought about by the sharing economy. Some of these arrangements are causing a certain amount of anxiety about the quality of jobs and the lack of security that that might bring along for some people. So I suppose, first of all, I talk about the impact of technology on the workplace. And I think it's fair to say that we're starting to see that whole industries now are being disrupted. And if we think about how we consume media, how we buy books, how we listen to music, that has just all changed for us, you know, without us almost even thinking too much about it. 
Um, if we think about the hotel industry, I was really struck uh, that the CEO of Marriott was making a presentation to investors about their growth uh, prospects for the next three years. And he said that they were going to open 25,000 rooms over the next three years. Some of that would be in new build hotels, and some of it would be through the acquisition of hotels. And as the, the chief executive of Airbnb heard that, he said, well, we can create 25,000 rooms over the weekend. So it just shows what companies are dealing with. And I'm interested to see um, the other day on the news that the Marriott are fighting back, and they've just gotten a robot um, they've just uh, put in a robot into reception in their hotel in London, and that robot can speak 17 languages or can interface with people in 17 languages. And, you know, he can bring coffee to the room and do a bit of room service and all that sort of stuff. And the, the thing that I found really amusing was that the, the designer, the, the engineering designer who, who designed the robot, he was being interviewed. And um, he said that he really recognised that it was hard for people to change. And so one of the things they've done uh, is to make the robot cute. And he said apparently it's a survival strategy for the robot. And th they want people to, to really embrace the ro robot, to like him. Um, and, um, is this a what? Is this a I think it's a him, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they want us to embrace him anyway, Joyce, and to uh, bring him into the, you know, bring, for us to bring him into our lives. And, you know, so when you kind of speak to the robot or you say thank you or you're nice to him, apparently he does a little dance and he oozes, and, you know, so people love him now in the UNA. But I think what the chief executive the Marriott then was making clear at this point was that this will of course free existing staff to do other work um, and I'm sure it will but it's hard to see that it also won't impact jobs and then this morning we hear in the news that Walmart have a robot now for cleaning floors they're testing that out in a number of of their shops and there's a little bit more anxiety uh, coming through um, from the people who would have been doing those <coughs> jobs. They don't see it quite in the same way that it's going to enhance their role. Um, so I think like almost every day we're hearing um, about some company that's doing something additional with artificial intelligence or robotics. And Frey and Osborne, two of the, I suppose, experts in this field, um, in the research in 2013, they forecast that 47% 40 of total US jobs were at risk from automation within the next few years. And the European uh, Brugel uh, Institute uh, then took that and applied it to Europe, uh, and they said that, that as much as 60% of jobs in Europe are at risk. Now, I suppose we know throughout history that people have lost their jobs to machines. It started off with manual jobs and then it was clerical jobs. But I think the thing that's a little bit different now it, is that it's uh, the knowledge workers or the professions that are also um, impacted um, by the rise of the robot. Um, I think, you know, we've seen lots of change before. American society went from something like 85% of the population or the workforce were farmers in the 1800s. It's 2% today. But I think also, you know, um, we've seen automation uh, transforming employment in the car industry as well. And, you know, before we ever start to think about driverless cars or anything, automation is well um, up and running within the car manufacturing industry. I went to, I was in Munich. Uh, last year and I went for a tour of the BMW factory there and it's actually well worth doing. It is fascinating, but hardly a person on the production line. I never saw anybody. But interestingly, uh, you know, when you talk to them and question to them, much more jobs for engineers, designers, supply chain people, sales people. Um, so other jobs were being um, <coughs> created. And I think if history is any guide, new industries and new jobs will be created, uh, just as they were in the past. Uh, but the difference, I think, in the past was that the changes happened over a longer period of time. They happened over decades or centuries. And I think the challenge for us now is not that, it's a, that, not that we'll have a world without work, but we'll have a world where work is changing constantly. And I think it's the pace of this change that's the real worry and real thing that we have to look out for. I mean, the question is, can we adapt quickly enough? Uh, what do we need to do at an individual level, at a business level, and also at a government and public policy level to address the challenges that lie ahead? And I suppose that really brings me to the, my second theme, which is 
can the, the need for the education system to modernise and meet the challenges that are presented by a workplace <coughs> that is driven by technology? Because I think all our companies now, regardless of what you do, um, are technology companies in some form or another. Um, and I think the reality of that is that change that's happening is that individuals need to be able to continually learn new skills uh, to be employable. Deloitte found in their 2014 study that even specific technology skills become obsolete within two and a half years. Now, I think that really shows us that in the new world of work, our success is going to largely depend on our appetite to continually learn and upskill throughout our whole life. And I think in Ireland, we really need to take lifelong learning much more seriously. Um, the lifelong lear learning rate in Ireland currently sits at 7%, which is behind the EU benchmark. A child today can expect to change jobs um, at least 10 times over the course of their lives, and five of those jobs probably haven't been created yet. Now, our education system, in my view, seems unsuited to preparing um, people for the pace and the level of changes that are happening in the workplace. But take my daughter Amy as an example. She did her Leaving Cert four years ago, and I have to say I was horrified uh, by the approach taken by students, uh, by both the students and the <coughs> teachers. I mean, this, the students are taught to the exam, and it's all about how can I maximise what the points are that I get. Mm. And, and it's a game. And, you know, the kids nowadays are so clever about figuring out what are the subjects that they can achieve e the points in to get what they want. And... Then you hear the universities saying, you know, you'll hear from the universities saying that, you know, they get these fabulous young people in and they don't have any critical thinking skills. They're not independent minded. Um, and I just think that's, that's a real challenge for us. And I suppose one of the, the things we hear praised about the Leaving Cert is this notion in some way that it's fair. Well, I just think it's anything but fair because the reality we know is that people who can afford to get their kids grinds and who can play to the system play to that and then other people you know that doesn't that's not a level playing field in, in any sort of way and I think that the government and policymakers face a significant challenge to really rethink our education strategy we have to move away from rote learning and start to focus on transferable skills I mean transferable skills really are where it's at and we have to be able to draw out a student's create, creative ability our education institutions have changed very little in the last 100 years, and they were set up to provide mass education for stable jobs and stable careers. This will not prepare us for the future that we're facing into. And the other thing is, from a competitive perspective, other con countries are ahead of us. If you take Finland, for example, they've recently switched their national curriculum to a phenomenon-based um, approach to education. So by 2020, the uh, traditional classroom sub subjects in Finland will be gone and they'll be replaced by a topical approach to learning and highlighting the four C's, which are essentially communication, creativity, critical thinking, and collaboration. And these are the skills that equip students to be problem solvers, to be independent thinkers, and to adapt to the fast pace of change that you know, they're going to face. I think it was Charles Darwin who said, it's not the strongest of the species that survive, but the one who's most adaptable to change. And I think, actually, aren't Ireland, have Ireland been voted, in, Ken, in terms of the workforce, number one in terms of adaptability? Have we? Flexibility, yes. isn't it? Yeah, which is good. <clears throat> but like, if you think about it, in a world of uncertainty, the skill you need is the ability to adapt and to get back on your feet when things go wrong. And I know that's, <coughs> you coming from an education point of view, Joyce, I know that's something that's hard to teach, but it can't be beyond us to include it in some shape or form in our curriculum. Um, finally, the relationship between the employer and the employee is changing. It's now clear that the tradition of a single job with a single employer for life is now the exception rather than the rule. Highly skilled workers, of course, are absolutely delighted with this. And certainly one of the things that we see in CPL is that they want exposure to diverse projects and to projects that help them to develop faster than if they were with a single employer. But the all, you know, um, these highly skilled people also want flexibility and autonomy, and they prefer to engage directly with their employer uh, on their terms of employment rather than have collectively bargained or universal 
terms and conditions. Now, there is another side to this story, uh, which is the whole gig, gig economy, and particularly um, where the gig economy has become associated with precarious work. And I suppose we're starting to see that relatively new term, the Uberization of work. And I think the gig economy sometimes sees people working at a customer's convenience, often on zero hour contracts. The workers in question don't receive holiday pay, basic employment rights. They've no protection against unfair dismissal. They've no right to redundancy payments. They've no right to receive a national minimum wage or paid holidays or sickness, or sickness pay. And of course, this can lead to social problems and like anxiety, depression, you know, higher stress levels and so on. And I think the, the real danger that we have is that we'll see a polarisation of the workforce. Um, and how we respond to these issues in a lot of ways will determine the future of our society. I was struck by a quote that, um, of Paul Krugman recently in the New York Times uh, when he called out that inequality and the falling fortunes of Americans' workers are now a choice, not a destin destiny imposed um, by the gods of the market. So to some extent, finding solutions for these kind of issues are in our own hands. But one of the big concerns that I have is that these type of arrangements, um, you know, where there aren't proper contracts and so on, are often talked about under the banner of flexibility or temporary work. And as a result, flexibility is getting a bad rap. Mm -hmm. And I really think it's time to reset the narrative around flexible working, uh, flexible hours, temporary work, part-time working, as a poorly paid and undesir as poorly paid and undesirable or precarious type of work. Many, many workers choose to work in se sectors where they have flexible hours. Um, and they work in those sectors for a myriad of reasons. Sometimes it can be a work-life balance issue. Sometimes it's a great way of transitioning people into the workforce. Um, there are lots of different uh, reasons why people uh, want to work and have flexibility. And the other thing is that the advantage of flexible working uh, and part-time contracts are significant for both the employers and for the employees. I believe that our focus should be on providing well-designed and stable but flexible working arrangements that create opportunities for decent work for those who wish to have that flexibility. All the evidence shows that good labour market policies that support flexibility also have a really strong positive impact on employment creation. And just look at the difference between Ireland and France as an example, where we have lot, with some flexibility in our labour, labour market and they have very little. Um, Denmark is another good example of an economy that has combined high flexibility with a social security net called flexicurity. Workers have fle flexibility to transition in and out of work, but actually in this new world we're going to have to be able to transition in and out of education to some extent also. Mm -hmm. Um, but the result is they have very high job turnover but very low unemployment. And the most important thing of all is that this model allows the Danish economy to adapt to the global changes that are taking place. So to conclude, I really believe that it's in our hands to develop strong and bold employment and education policies. I'm concerned about some of the current legislation that's coming before the Dáil, for example, there's a zero, zero hours contract legislation coming before the Dáil, and my concern is that the way it's drafted at the moment is going to have unintended consequences, and particularly for the precariat. Um, we shouldn't rush to legislate without carefully considering what the future looks like and what regulation will be appropriate in a circumstance where the future workplace is driven by technology. I hope that our government can see that. Please take every opportunity to let them know and do remind them that robots don't vote. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.